Welcome to Dezine Day. Thank you all so much for coming. Dezine has been a virtual brand for the last 13 years. And it was last year, we suddenly started to think about turning our online community into a physical community. We launched Dezine Awards last year and found that when we got people together for the speakers' dinners, that online virtual community, which is powerful and global and you know, with three million people, you, something different happens. We have a, such a, a warmth, such a, a globally powerful network of people who are all committed to architecture and design and all believe in the power, its power to change and improve the world. So a few months ago, we had this crazy idea of doing a little conference. Um, three months later, here we are. We're, we're delighted with our speaker lineup, and we're delighted we managed to fill this hall, which looked intimidatingly large the first couple of times we came to look at it. Um, welcome, everyone. And thank you so much to our amazing speakers who are going to come and um, talk about how architecture and design is going to be in the future, the forces that are important in the world, and how that interfaces with what you all do. I mean, basically, we've taken Dezine's editorial agenda and put it on the stage. That's the idea of today. And clearly, the thing that's on everyone's minds at the moment is the environment, climate change, sustainability, all of those issues. And that will crop up again and again. I'm delighted to welcome to the stage Paola Antonelli, who's the senior curator of architecture and design at MoMA in New York. It was Paola's exhibition, Broken Nature, at the Triennale in Milan this year that I think like, brought together so many thoughts, so many concerns about the way the world is. Please give it up for Paola Antonelli. Thank you, Marcus. And thank you for inviting me here. Uh, it's uh, interesting to hear Marcus say that the Triennale of Milano was defining, time defining, because it happened in 2018, 2019, but it was a proposal from 2013. And as I was discussing yesterday with some colleagues, sometimes getting a rejection comes with a good reason, right? So waiting a few years made it so that I was part of a groundswell, and it's important to, remem to remember that. This was just one of many exhibitions happening at the same time, many artists' projects, designers, enterprises, and just altogether community actions that deal and flow in the same direction, that of being more responsible towards uh, the planet, towards other species, and just adjusting our lives to uh, think of a better future, perhaps. And this is quite interesting because my thought of a better future comes with an acknowledgement and an acceptance of the extinction. And uh, it's something that in Italy was taken as great pessimism. You know, it Italians like this kind of sensationalistic uh, titles for newspapers. So the prophet of doom, and uh, no, then in, in, it became positive in the article. But the funny thing is that acknowledging our extinction is just being realistic. You know, what I always said at the beginning of the show in my presentations is that we will become extinct. We don't have control over that fact, but we have some control on the when and control, quite a bit of control on the how. And if we start designing and planning our own elegant extinction, maybe the next species will remember us as a little better than just morons, right? So it was really that kind of great spirit that made me think as a designer. Designers like to set limitations and then do wonders within them. This is the uh, cover of the catalog. The catalog represented this glacier in Switzerland that's been covered in fabric to prevent it from erosion. That's what we're at. We are at the point of trying to save glaciers by covering them. And you know that about a month and a half ago in, uh, in Iceland, there was the first memorial service for the first glacier that completely disappeared in Iceland. So we're talking reality. And yesterday, there was a study by two American researchers that re really left me stunned that talked about the fact that there was wrong data about the altitude of cities around the world and that, in truth, cities are two meters lower. And therefore, in 2050, there will be many more cities that will be submerged by water. 
water. So data are coming to us fast and furious, as Sophie said, and we're trying to make sense of them, but it's true that we need to do something about things. What can we do? We all do our bit. I'm a curator, so I do exhibitions. And this is the entrance of the Triennale di Milano. Beautiful building. I've been at MoMA for 25 and a half years. And uh, it's the first time in 25 and a half years that I work outside of MoMA. But this is where I started my whole career. So interestingly, I knew the smell of the building. And I also uh, was so riveted to be in my hometown where people are interested in design. People love design, so they flock to a place like the Triennale. At MoMA, I always say, my public comes to see Matisse and Picasso, and then I attract them like moth paper to the design show, and then they stay there. But I have to say that having an exhibition for the citizens of Milan here really was riveting. And uh, you see here, this was the entrance to the Triennale, and this is the great graphic design by Anna Kulacek, who's a young Ukrainian uh, designer. We asked her to think of all the different pressure points that we can have in our lives to try and be more responsible. And this is the curatorial team when I say we. I just wanted to show them to you because we took over the Triennale from left to right, Erika Petrillo, Ala Tanir, myself, Laura Mayran. Ala is from Lebanon and she went home. She lives in New York, but she went home yesterday to participate in the big changes that are happening in her country. So many different ways to actually be responsible and reactive to what's happening. And here is more of the graphics of uh, the Triennale that Anna devised. So the entrance to the Triennale happened this way. The first thing that you encountered was this kind of diorama and uh, assembly of all the different pressure points with also uh, some of the uh, explanations. But in truth, there are many different ways, and we presented just a few of the strategies that are possible. Some shots from the Triennale, the uh, design of the exhibition was by Studio Folder, that are Elisa Pasquale and Marco Ferrari and Matilde Cassani. And uh, Studio Folder also designed the catalog. So it was really a big choral gesture. We tried to use materials that were all recyclable. Uh, we got the fabric donated and reused by the Triennale. Actually, the Architectural Association in London wanted it, so they were <laughs> fighting over reusing the fabric. And uh, we tried to be once again, as responsible as possible, even though we didn't have the benefit of Sophie's calculations, maybe we should. But you see here, we um, wanted to highlight the fact that being responsible doesn't mean only recycling. I mean, this is something that is well known to this audience, but sometimes needs to be remembered by the public at large. And it's very important to notice that we wanted this exhibition to be for citizens. We set out from the beginning with some goals that held, had to do really with citizens. When I say citizens, I mean anybody that comes in, children, adults, um, people from all over the world, and we had these three main goals. The first one was we wanted every citizen to leave the Triennale having a sense of long time. You know, as human beings, we tend to think in matters of like one, two, three generations ahead, our children, our children's children. Maybe we can imagine our great grandsons and granddaughters, but it's really hard to have a feeling in your stomach of what will happen generations away. We wanted people to leave having a sense of that, even just an imagination. Second goal, we wanted people to have a sense of the complexity of the systems that we live in without being scared by them. We wanted people to feel that complexity can be our friends if we learn to manage the tools that can make sense of it, if we learn to be critical. I believe that the job of a contemporary design curator is not to tell people what's good and what's bad or to be an arbiter of style, as sometimes I hear, but rather it is to help people sharpen their own critical knives. That's what matters. We need to be all more informed, better informed, and more critical so that we can face everything that comes our way. Third goal, we wanted people to leave the Triennale with an idea, at least one, of how we can adjust our life, our everyday life, to be more responsible, whether it is using a biodegradable pregnancy test or whether it is offsetting your airplane travel. So it was about also giving a sense of possible methodologies. And these are the uh, icons that Anna devised for us. And once again, they're just the beginning of something more. One could add their own icons to this list. 
The entrance of the Triennale was dramatic because the building is dramatic. But in order to modulate all of these different moments and to achieve all those goals, we had many different, uh, many different collaborators. We had, first of all, four commissions. And you're looking here at the first one in order of appearance. It is Neri Oxman, and it is her new project, which is to try and find a way to use melanin at an architectural scale. If you know uh, Neri's work, it's all about finding new ways, new processes, and also building new technology for uh, a different way of building and a different way of designing. In this particular case, she chose the pigment that has um, that is one of the more spread elements all over nature, and that also is at the basis of so much uh, injustice in the world. So it has this double weight and this double value. And uh, at Design in Daba, so in Cape Town a few years ago, she took the prompt and the hint from the Mandela Foundation to try and think of a monument, almost like a wailing wall, a melanin-based wailing wall for table mountain in uh, Cape Town. But also, if melanin could be used really at an architectural scale, it would become a very sensible and responsible uh, facade treatment. You can imagine the facade becoming darker as the sun grows higher and as the heat increases. So the same kind of defense mechanism that melanin has in nature, it could could be applied also to buildings. So the first demonstration was the small column that was at the entrance of the Triennale. You walk then in, and the first feeling, the scale was cosmic. It was about trying to give a sense of the ensemble of our uh, effect, our impact on Earth. We started out with the NASA images of change that are in the public domain. Anybody can access them. They show the before and after of different moments in different places on Earth, before and after either human-made or nature-made changes, before and after three months or three centuries, just to show how things have changed for real, because once again, it's about giving people a sense of the long time. And behind these images of change was the second commission by Akurat, and in particular, Georgia Lupi, who's now become part of Pentagram. It was a, a beautiful visualization of changes and evolution of mankind attached to, connected to the evolution and the changes in the universe and in astronomy and astrology. It was in, No, not astrology, I'm sorry, astronomy. And uh, it's a beautiful visualization, kind of hard to read, but at the same time giving a global sense of the impact. From that, we moved on to uh, an almost natural history of the future, a natural history museum of the future, with the work of artists trying to show fossils from 50 uh, years uh, ahead of us, in front of us, that also have plastics in them, or beautiful uh, pictures that are taken with defective cameras and expired film that show the uh, debris of plastic that you can find in the ocean. So this kind of sad celebration of what we could leave behind us. And here is the star of the whole exhibition, Mercy, a little female octopus, but, and it's the work of Aki Inomata. Aki took an ammonite shell. Ammonites were the ancestors of squids and octopi, and they have been extinguished for millennia, and recast it in, in 3D printed plastic and put it next to Mercy. And Mercy, without thinking about it twice, in five minutes just whoop, went back into her ancestral home. So once again, it's about giving a sense of time, a sense of the fact that we all have a memory of what happened millennia ago somehow, and that people that will come centuries from now will have a memory of now too. From that, we moved into um, Oh, I wanted to give you a better sense of mercy here. It's like, yes, beautiful. Everybody loved this little thing, and understandably so. From that, we moved into, once again, this sense of past and present by looking at the work of uh, Daisy Ginsburg. She will speak tonight. She will be the closing keynote. And Cecil Tolas and Christina Gapakis, who resuscitated an extinct flower by reconstructing the, the scent of the flower using the DNA that was in, in a herbarium at Harvard University. And also the sound of disappearing stars. You might have uh, heard about a year and a half ago, 
that scientists were able to record the sound of two colliding stars that collided millions of light years ago. And this is rendered in a beautiful symphony um, <coughs> Ensemble. Oh, I didn't remember that I had also the sound in this. This we're moving now into the real repair and replenishing part of the exhibition, and this is the work of Alex Goad, who is uh, an Australian designer that has been casting in ceramic these kind of scaffolds that can rebuild actually the coral reef in Australia. It's a beautiful work that shows how restorative design can really happen in a literal way. When I say restorative design, this I'm using one of the keywords of the exhibition. And the idea came from restaurants. Restaurants were born in France in the 18th century as places where you could go and uh, have uh, healthy food. They thought that bouillon was healthy, so that you could have bouillon that really restored your health. But at the same time, you could be in a convivial and pleasant environment. And this is one of the messages of the exhibition. To be responsible, to be uh, just thinking and minding the future and thinking of the rest of the world, you don't have to sacrifice sensuality, beauty, elegance, all of the different tropes that have made design so interesting. And I also do believe that beauty is a sign of respect towards other human beings. So we wanted to really show in the exhibition that design can be responsible and gorgeous at the same time. More repairs were also in different projects that were dispersed all over the world, like Agua Carioca. There was an attempt to show how water, rainwater, can be used and recycled and harnessed in different places. And uh, this was particularly applied to Rio de Janeiro at the scale of the city, of the neighborhood, and of the block. It's the beautiful work of Uz Architects. And also, with the second commission, with the third commission in order of appearance, we wanted to show that communities are at the basis of so much of what we are discussing. So we started from the cosmic scale and we moved into territory and then communities. This is the work of Sigil. Sigil is a wonderful collective of architects and, and artists from Lebanon, and also some of them based in New York, that work on the Syrian uh, uh, culture and tradition. Every time they get a commission for a biennial or a triennial, they take part of the money and they make something happen in Syria that connects almost in a parallel universe to the installation that happens, say, in Venice, where I first saw their work, or in Milan. In this particular case, they decided to work on the import importance of birds in Syrian culture and tradition. And they constructed a whole parallel universe in the Golan Heights by making a little model of the Triennale where they had installed this beautiful scarecrow that is wearing a talismanic cloth and built it in the Golan Heights where they also used the money to initiate a new library. They also printed, as they always do, a gorgeous book that was on display in the Triennale and that also was sent to the Golan Heights talking about the birds in, the, in Syrian culture. A beautiful, really poignant uh, installation that used very, very well the territory uh, of the Golan Heights where it happened and also used very well the Triennale. It was very beautiful. Remaining in the community, we also wanted to show once again, time and the importance of material culture. Sometimes when we discuss what we should do today, what we're doing is we are reprising what our grandmothers used to do. You know, not throwing away any part of the cow if you really have a cow. Um, if you have to kill a reindeer, use all of it. There's another uh, example in the exhibition that is about that. And very simply, try to be mindful of the length of time. And here were three examples. Chiara Vigo uh, from my native land, Sardinia, that still goes and finds this like sea silk and makes it herself. And then at the very end of the, um, of the hall, the ama divers in Japan, the women divers, their whole material culture. And on the right hand side, Abel Rodriguez from Colombia, who draws by, uh, by heart from memory all of these plants and animals that have become extinct in Colombia out of the oral tradition that has been transmitted from him. So this sense of memory that becomes also part of everyday life. 
And all of a sudden, we, we plunged from the cosmic and the con community into the mundane, into the everyday life, into trying to use cloth to protect ourselves from the sun instead of using lotions and creams that go to deposit a film on the ocean, trying to recuperate material culture from your country and also try to replenish crops of uh, corn and types of corn that have become extinct in Mexico, or up there, raising robotic nature thinking of what will happen when robots will be so embedded in our lives that there will be kids that will be robotic natives. So starting to think about the everyday, as I was mentioning to you before, it was important for us to contrast the um, de-extinct flower with the biodegradable pregnancy test. It was important to talk about dying stars or colliding stars and show the ruby cup. It was important to also talk about how to be more respectful of, li of, of life by pairing um, a scholar, a doctor from MIT that's been studying linguistics, either for bullying on the internet or for uh, you know med for doctors and medical centers, and find out that so many women die of heart attacks just because ER centers are not able to recognize the linguistic signs. So we paired this doctor with uh, a great illustrator out of Russia, and we asked her to prepare this kind of Heimlich maneuver poster that can be shown in every ER centers that displays the fact that when men come and have a heart attack, they say that they have an elephant walking on their chest. And instead, women said, oh, we took the stairs too many times today, so we feel a little fatigued. Same thing, heart attack. So it really is interesting to have this contrast. And I was telling you before how it was important for us to have an exhibition for citizens. In the center of this, this is the area about everyday life, was this capsula mundi, which is for green burial. It is uh, the idea of having this egg, the corpse goes in it, uh, seeds at the top, planted, a, a tree grows. Very simple, straightforward. But you have to see the reaction of the, of the people, especially the elderly people of Milan. It was quite fantastic. I had several, uh, this lady, this Milanese lady, perfectly coiffed, uh, you know, pantsuit, perfect, perfect uh, handbag, perfect uh, shoes, saying, oh, she was about 75, saying, I want to be buried there. How do I get in touch with them? It was really, I mean, those are the kind of reactions that you want. In the everyday life, we moved slowly into this idea of waste as a new material, with several good examples, Kosuke Araki and uh, his uh, cutlery and vessels that are made of uh, ground coffee and other debris of, uh, um, of edible materials, and Carolyn Slotte that reprises thrown away ceramics and plastics in these beautiful art pieces, and Studio Swine, your own Studio Swine, with their project that was for Sao Paulo of this portable foundry for aluminum cans that can be instantly transformed in stools that can then replenish street life, a different kind of circularity that takes into account metrics that are not re ready for us yet, but that we will uh, soon, sooner or later uh, use. And uh, the work of Christian Meindertsma, this is together with curator Jane Withers, who you know very well here in London, for actually, um, um, what's the name, for a, a textile company, for Quadrat, thank you, to have this new acoustic insulation material that is using leftovers from Quadrat textiles. Really beautiful. Once again, beauty elegance and sensibility. From there, we moved into new ways of building with new materials, with uh, self-jammable structures that are made of mushroom mycelium, uh, the superstar of today's research together with algae, and, uh, and uh, um, together with algae mostly, and this jammed bio-welding, these structures that will be made of one material, therefore much easy to recycle and reuse where the material sets by itself. And Neri Oxman again with the Silk Pavilion that actually we're going to have in a special installation at MoMA in February. I'm working on a Neri Oxman exhibition right now in which the silkworms are the construction workers and uh, uh, work on a kind of scaffold that is architecturally constructed, but they are set in motion and then do their own thing, collaborating with humans in a seamless way without being killed the way they would be in the silk industry. So a 
tends to really work together with animals. The star of this particular section about waste as a new material was Forma Fantasma, whose project, or Streams, started in Melbourne about three years ago at their triennial and then was reprised as a commission in our triennial. Why? Because when a research of design is important, as theirs was, it's not fair to, to ask a group of designers to produce something new for every triennial and biennial. We wanted to make sure that their research was treated almost like a scientific research, and therefore given the time and the money that it deserved. It's a research that is about the uh, dark web of uh, e-waste and how it goes from the west and the north of the hemisphere into the rest of the world and, and feeds this kind of like exploitation of labor and toxicity altogether together of the economies. And they created these beautiful uh, pieces of furniture that are almost Trojan horses to talk about the darkness of it all. And they had produced the furniture for Melbourne, and we asked them to actually polish and publish the research. So in the exhibition, we had the furniture, but also a number of interviews and a number of documentation materials that really showed what goes on behind the scenes systems and new ways of manufacturing also went into the display for Atelier Luma, the algae platform in, in Arles that is doing so much to teach the world how to use the kind of uh, consequences of our pollution. As you might know, algae pro proliferation is a byproduct of so many phosphates and other polluting um, elements that we are uh, sending into our water streams. Algae platform tries to go around the world using this kind of fab lab for bioplastics and teach people to use the seaweed and the algae that are local to produce by 3D printing vessels and elements of the material culture of the place. So it is a circularity that takes advantage or tries to use also the dark consequences of our actions. They had a whole lab at the Triennale, so they had workshops. People could really come and try uh, uh, what the fab lab was about. From that, we moved into systems. I told you that systems were so important also uh, as a way to try and uh, familiarize people with complexity. One of the first examples was this beautiful work by a studio folder that kind of tries to uh, map the shifting borders that are between countries, for instance, between Italy and Austria, where the border was marked by a real watershed once upon a time, but as glaciers have shifted and the climate has changed, the border has disconnected. The geographic border has disconnected from the political border. Sensors in the mountains measure these shifts and render them in real time in a diagram in my gallery and in other galleries afterwards. Your own forensic oceanography, of course, was part of the whole discussion, and it's such an important, um, it's such an important enterprise. In this case, instead of forensic architecture, we had oceanography because we wanted to talk about the migration problems that are happening in, in the Mediterranean. So many crimes, crimes are committed, and it's important to show that architecture and design world also participates in trying to unveil the truth. This was the case of a German NGO that was accused by the Italian authorities of colluding with the traffic while instead forensic oceanography proved with their own tools and methods that they were not because they had turned to go back to the Libyan coasts to pick up more people. It was, it's a long story, but you know forensic oceanography and forensic architecture, so you can imagine. It was important to show it also to the Italian public. And this beautiful visualization, Anatomy of an AI System by Kate Crawford and Vlad Anjoler, showed everything that is behind an Amazon Echo, both hardware and software, where everything is sourced from even when it comes to these systems of thought. I'm going quickly through all this because it's important for me to show the flow of the exhibition even more than talking about the uh, uh, projects themselves, but you can find all of this if you want in our website. Towards the end of the exhibition, we started moving into empathy. We thought that the best closing could be empathy. And I have to say, I tried to instill 
my own emotions in the exhibition. But, you know, as a curator, you never know whether it's going to work or not. And I was really touched by the fact that so many people said that they found the exhibition moving. In a way, this closing was important, showing empathy not only towards other human beings, but also towards nature in all of its scales and forms. This is a, a, a Japanese manga about a little boy that can see bacteria and talk to them and microbes. We've been talking so much about the microbiome lately, it's important to also give it some presence, some personality. Or the work of uh, this great artist, oh no, sorry, here we are, of this great designer, who you know pretty well, Thomas Thwaites, who decided to leave the worries of humankind behind and live as a goat for four days. He built that contraption, and then he, uh, he just grew, uh, walked up the mountain, and the goats adopted him. So that was the lesson beyond everything else. Uh, or the great work by Mustafa Farouki of the Lab Lab for Architecture in Brooklyn, who decided to devise a facility, an intake facility for angels. It's kind of a way to speak about immigrants once again. It's an Ellis Island for these beings that represent so much of the issues of today with transgender identity and gender fluidity. You know, angels have no sex. So when they come to Earth, they need to be given one somehow, according to the old system. They get to the Williamsburg Bridge, and then they get flown into, they get uh, sucked into Governor's Island, where they have, where they are assigned an identity, a social security number, of course, and also a sex. It's a very beautiful work that talks about what it means to become human. But this is one of the pieces that moved me the most. This is a Latinx photographer, um, and Laura Aguilar. I saw her work at first in uh, a November issue of The New Yorker, and I couldn't believe my eyes. I was really drawn to it. These are self-portraits in nature. And she says, she said, unfortunately, she passed away. I tried to get in touch with her. I waited too long, and she passed away. But uh, she used to say that she identified with boulders. Now, that's in a way... My goal, I hope it's going to be everybody's goal, that of trying to really feel what it, not what it means, but the importance of the existence of other beings, even what we consider inanimate beings. And the exhibition ended with Sanctuary, Patricia Piccinini, an Australian artist that does all these monsters and aliens that bring you to tears, they're so tender. This was her work, Bonobos, that was a way to kind of transcend age, gender, to show this love that is really uh, beyond any kind of description. And it really worked in the exhibition because people got to the end and almost like burst in tears or melted. You know, we are uh, setting up a, set, a design, we're setting up a movie. We're setting up a theater play when we make an exhibition, and we want to really achieve our goals. Um, the great animal orchestra that is now on display at 101 Strand by uh, United Visual Artists together with Bernie Krause gave this moment of pause to the public at the end of the exhibition. And then, of course, there were the international participations. And I am sorry to the other countries, the 21 countries that were part of it, if I didn't go into more detail. Uh, but it was fantastic. You know, when you put out a call for entries as a curator, you don't know what's going to happen. And the response was wonderful. We have a website, as I mentioned to you, that is now a little dormant, but I think the Triennale is going to keep on going with this theme because it still makes sense. And this is the great uh, advisory committee that I had helping us. Of course, you always need to have people that can help you with everything you don't know, and there's so much that we don't know at all times. So different geographies, Daisy is also part of it. And it was really a way to be knowledgeable, at least, if not represent different parts of the world. But this is really what made us happy. I said that this exhibition was meant to be for citizens. Well, the most touching moments were when all the kids for f that was, were observing Fridays for the Future elected the Triennale as their meeting place. That's what happened. That's what uh, curation to me is about, to really achieve a message that is delivered and that also is meaningful to people, to citizens, and also to the world in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paola. Come and join me over here, and we'll have a little uh, conversation. And then, we'll, if there's time, we will have audience questions. 
The name broken nature um, implies that nature is broken, but is it fixable? You said at the beginning of your talk, and you've said in, in, in interviews you've done about the exhibition, that we are going to become extinct. So it's all about controlling the way the ending is perceived. But it sounds like quite a pessimistic message. It's not. See, it's, it really is not. Um, we all die, right? Not that it's pleasant, but we do. And when we realize at some point in our lives, we start having it in our stomach. I'm not there yet, thank God. But we start thinking of our legacy. That's it. It's about thinking of legacy. It's not pessimistic. Pessimistic would be being in denial. And instead, uh, I mean, pessimistic in a different way. And instead, knowing it and doing something beautiful out of it is the best. Regarding the idea of broken nature, is it fixable? Everything is fixable, but it will never be the same. It's kind of the the Eastern concept of broken, you know? So uh, you give things new life, or the Helayon Herius concept, you know? It's, you give things new life. Uh, they will never be the same, but you make the best out of what you have. So it's responsibility, frankly. And then it sort of triggers the next question, which is if we're all gonna become extinct, or if humanity is gonna become extinct, what's the point in even doing anything? You might as well like just let it all roll and um, actually actively destroy stuff. Well, once again, do we want to be remembered like the dinosaurs? Just last night, Arthur was telling me that maybe dinosaurs had feathers. We don't even know it. You know what I'm saying? It's like they have become the epitome of, sorry, stupidity or like bad luck. You know, and I, I hope we will not be remembered that way. I hope that our extinction will count. But who will be around to remember us? Well, that I don't know. There's a lot of science fiction. There are those who say that it's going to be a mixture of AI and ants. I don't know. No matter what, I think that we should leave something to be remembered well for. I mean, you're talking, when you talk about extinction, I guess you're asking us to view, to extend our notion of our own mortality to our entire civilization in a way. But what do you think about people like Elon Musk who are saying, okay, look, Earth is doomed, so let's move to Mars? Well, that's his take. And uh, it, I'm happy there are people like him. You know, this morning I was watching uh, a program that was talking about the landing on the moon, which moon landing, you know, which was such an emotional program. I mean, I could imagine what it meant when the capsule is about to land and there's dust, you know, it kind of puffs dust from the surface of the moon. Those things are important too. Without these flights and leaps of imagination, we wouldn't be able to do our job. And once again, we're a community. So there are people like Elon Musk and there are people that instead are just picking up the trash. There are all these different ways to live. You can do something very small or you can do something very big and you're equally important. And I guess in a way then you could say that the, the kind of the angst that we feel at the moment is because maybe as a civilization, maybe as, as a community, we're trapped. We, we look back at nature and we think we came from this kind of um, beautiful Eden-like planet. The future is going to be very, very different. Our future as a species maybe doesn't exist. Our future as a species maybe involves moving to different planets and relying on artificial technology. And we're kind of stuck in the middle between a, a past which in hindsight looks para like paradise, but actually wasn't and a future which is terrifying? Well, um, that's your interpretation. <laughs> Rather than angst, I wish we used anger. So uh, th the past was not paradisiac. I, I, I'm totally convinced of that. And paradise, frankly, is for the other life. Uh, what I'm interested in is doing better. And I'm interested in the only reason to live, in my opinion, well, the only way to live well is to be for others and amongst others. And it's not that I am religious or spiritual. It's just that's what makes me feel good. And so um, anger could be a better engine to try and improve things in the future. Anger at ourselves. Greta has anger at the older generation. That's fine. But I think that that sense of action is what is needed. And the future is not really terrifying. It's just uh, uh, it just needs to be made better. And the final question, I mean, we're having a session later about the circular economy, and, and the advocates of the circular economy believe that you can have an economy, you can have growth, you can have growth that is in harmony with planet Earth, and it's, it actually um, proffers itself as a solution. Are you saying, 
forget it, guys, it's game over? Uh, no, the opposite. Actually, the circular economy is incredibly exciting, and it's filled with mechanisms and with different scales of action that really make me incredibly interested. And that's the opposite of what I'm saying. You know, what I'm saying is, let's dive into the circular economy, let's find all the good necessary ways to have a better sense of responsibility and a better economy on Earth. So, not at all. I am against uh, self-annihilation and going out with a bang. Um, let's do it well. <laughs> right, I think we have time for one or two quick um, questions. By the way, when you ask questions, can you make sure they actually are questions rather than <laughs> lengthy <laughs> statements? Um, does someone want to ask a question to Paula? Okay, a gentleman here in the middle. Can we get the microphone? So I've, I've chosen the most difficult member of the audience for you to get the microphone to. Yeah, but he had the bigger hair. <laughs> uh, thank you. <laughs> um, John Ennis from Scotland, uh, Edinburgh. Um, you managed, the, the train alley was absolutely knockout, and you took uh, something epic and made it very intimate and offered a, you know, a sense of a way in. Did you get any um, sense of one thing more than others that people took away as that call to action that you offered? Well, it's interesting because um, um, you see what the Instagram heroes are, but sometimes you don't get the message enough. But <clears throat> the biggest message I got was this sense of emotion, which, you know, it's not one thing in particular, but it seems that p the synthesis happened, which, you know, design is about synthesizing. So the idea that people in the end were able to interiorize all that, it was the biggest message. Thank you. And one more question. Over there, yeah. Uh, my name's Claire Richards from Footwork. Uh, you talk about uh, reparation strategies as, I suppose, part of what you describe as being successful humans. Um, and I was really pleased to see how you were focusing on building trust, reconciliation of social relationships, uh, empathy. A lot of us here are designers. My question to you is that we've been creating, we have evidence of human architecture going back millennia. And do you think that we've lost the knowledge to create human architecture? No, um, I think, I don't think we've lost anything, truly. I think we just need to find it again. And the term reparations that you use is a term that I used at the very beginning in the United States because I'm in, because in the US it's incendiary. When you talk about reparations, you talk about slavery and the fact that we need to repair what one race and one class has done to another. So I used it knowingly in the United States because I wanted to talk about the fact that the ins having enslaved nature, having enslaved the planet, and having to repair. Um, and uh, I use repair or restore depending on where I am and depending on the strategy of the talk. But re reparation means recuperating also what it means to be human. So I think we need, we have it all in ourselves, and we are on the right track to also go back to that type of architecture. Paula, our time is up, unfortunately, but we do have a little surprise for you. And um, that is for you, Paula. You're the first Thank of you. our change makers. Oh my God! Let's I give it up it. for Paula Antonelli. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> I love it, really. <laughs>